It is a pleasure to be with you. Um, I'd like to know who you are. So um, perhaps we could go around and just say a sentence about yourself. Uh, are, are you, are, is everybody from the same denomination, or is this uh, an eclectic group? Or you're all up, all over the place. That's, that's good. OK. If you could just tell, tell me your name and um, what ministry you're in, what church and what ministry you're in. So that, that would be good, starting over here. Uh, We're going to cross, yeah, we'll go across then, yes. Uh, Kim Lawrence, I'm a big review in the as well, the social pastor in the temporary economy. All right. I'm Jeff Ferriol, I'm at uh, Grace Point Community Church, I'm at Beach Church as well, um, and associate pastor. That's in White Rock? It's in White Rock. Ah, yes. yeah. yeah, just down the road from, yeah. Uh, I'm Jason Thompson, and I graduated last April here, and I'm in the studies department. Great. <coughs> Gary Simpson, pastor of Broadway, and I'm Church and Children. I'm Adam Steady Smith, and I'm currently employed. Or maybe I'll stop. Yeah. <laughs> let, me, let me tell you, this is, this, this is one of our former students from Regent. It's Stacy Roddy Smith's husband, and he was my TA. And uh, he'd make an excellent pastor in one of your churches, just, just saying. <laughs> Crossroads Community Church. 
Stephen Phillips, and I'm a development director at Partners International. Calvin Kapstinski, member of Bakerview Mennonite. I'm on the mission board. I'm a BA alumni from here a few years back in biblical studies and have a ministry for the street people around here. Algera and Mission Alliance Solo Pastor. from Ross Road Community Church in Abbotsford, who's also the church. I'm Johanna Campbell, and I'm, I'm from the Abbotsford Evangelical Evangelical Free Church, and I'm in pastoral care there. I'm also a part of Trinity West. Um, <coughs> Phil Wheaton from Bethel Mennonite Church in Langley. I'm Karen Heidebrecht Thiessen, lead pastor at Level Ground Mennonite. I'm Leonard Clausen, uh, one of the associates at King Road. Same as that over there. Then, right? <laughs> I don't know what I did wrong. <laughs> <laughs> On the outs. <laughs> uh, Stan Bamman, I'm the dean of students here at Columbia. Wonderful. All right. You've met yeah. me. Yeah. Rob Ayer at Crossroads Community Church in Chilliwack. Okay. Rob's my pastor. Right. Is that quite hard? <laughs> Is that quite hard? It's quite easy, actually. Yeah, I'm sure it would be. Larita Boss, I'm the Service Learning and Continuing Education Associate here. Thanks, Larita. Great. Well, it's a pleasure to be among you uh, to try to serve you in whatever, whatever ways I can. Um, I chose the topic of ethics uh, for this time together because I am quite burdened about the area, as you probably understood from my talk. Um, and I also think that we are at a crossroads in the Christian church in Canada where we need to speak well about some of the, the ethical challenges we're facing. Um, and, uh, you know, where we come from uh, theologically, where we come from ecclesiastically, often tempers how we, what we think about ethics. So I understand that um, we, uh, we may not all uh, see things the same way today, so that's, that's okay. We, we want to have a good conversation. So I'm going to speak for about an hour each time, then you're going to speak for half an hour. You're going to respond to questions and groups, and then I'm going to have feedback from those groups. Um, because um, I'm always learning. I, I, I really, I, I've got so much to learn, and so I want to learn with you. That's the, the attitude. Let me begin by reading the text again that sort of, the exposition of it was this morning. I wish I'd had more time for that. Um, but it's sort of also, I think, the the spirit of the day, we do not lose heart. Therefore, since through God's mercy, we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. And I just unpack that a little bit by speaking about God's mercy as, that's, as that is expounded in the previous chapter in a Christological way. Um, the person of Christ being in communion with him, he being in communion with us by the incarnation and us being in communion with him. Um, by the Spirit, and then contemplation, and really that's the heart of Christian transformation. That's the heart of Christian ethics. This is gospel ethics at its best. We come from that cradle. We come from that place of uh, hope for our own transformation. But I also think it communicates some principles that guide how we speak in the public square about ethics. Uh, because, you know, there's some things we can't speak in the public square about very plainly, but the tone with which we speak in the public square, I think, needs work, um, as well as some of the, um, the motivations uh, and expositions of why Christians have the positions they do, being grounded in Torah, by and large, and then being, having the telos of shalom. Um, and I actually think uh, you know, how, how, you peop how you speak in the public square is a complex matter, and not all of us will agree on that even, I'm sure. But here are some strands of thought that may undergird what I say about speaking in the public square. The first is, I think we always have to speak evangelically. By evangelically, I don't mean capital E, as evangelicals. Sometimes I wished I didn't have to speak on behalf of the evangelicals. 
um, because we don't always behave very well. Um, when I say evangelical, I mean with a small e. What I mean by that is euangelion, the gospel. It's the gospel. If you take ethics outside of the gospel, it becomes the worst news. It actually becomes something other than Christian truth. But ethics within the framework of the Christian gospel um, then becomes good news. And it becomes the source of shalom uh, for the people of God. So we need to speak, we need to speak evangelically. Um, also because I believe God is at work ahead of us. You know, some, depending on your view of hamartiology, what you believe sin has done and how much sin affects the image of God in people, uh, you may say, well, what's the point of speaking to, into the culture? Everybody's dead and trespasses and sins. What's the point? You know, why should we? Let's just, let's just huddle. Let's just huddle in our little communities. Um, and I, and I, to be a little controversial, I kind of feel a little bit of that in Stanley Harwas. If you're familiar with Stanley Harwas's work in ethics, I feel a little bit of that. Um, but I know that's not absolutely true for Stanley. Stanley does speak in the public square, but nevertheless, what he and William Willimon encourage sometimes sounds like, let's just be these little communities and the world can go to hell on a handbasket if it wants. Um, and I react to that because I was raised in the Plymouth Brethren and the very conservative wing of the Plymouth Brethren who really do think the world's going to hell in a handbasket and don't really care. I mean, they care about evangelism, but they don't care about social ethics or any of those, those kinds of things generally. At least I'm, I'm caricaturing my own denomination very crudely here, but uh, some of it's true. Um, so where am I going? I'm saying uh, we need to speak evangelically because God is at work ahead of us by the Spirit. So even if everybody is dead in trespasses and sins and politicians that don't know Jesus, I choose to believe that God is at work ahead of what I'm about to say and that all hope is not yet lost of God working evangelically in our culture. Uh, so it's on, you know, on that basis that I think we must speak. And then secondly, because, and this does relate to your hamartiology, and that is that there's some semblance of natural law within every human being. Um, by the way, I didn't intend to say what I'm saying right now. It's not on the screen. It's just preliminary. Um, I'm giving my heart for, public, for being in the public square uh, and, and reasons why we can be in the public square. So what, we must speak evangelically um, because of, of God's work. And secondly, we must speak evangelically because, because even the Torah was given evangelically. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. You shall have no other gods before me. The, I, I would argue that the, that the, um, the ethos of the Ten Commandments is you get to do this because you're my covenant people rather than you have to do this or I will punish you. Um, there, I mean, if you, do, if you do step out of it, then the consequences are, are inevitable. But, so I would argue that the Torah is, is good for society. I would also argue that the Torah is valuable for Christian ethics, and especially in the public square. Um, Klaus Bockmiel, who used to teach uh, Christian ethics at, at Regent, always would say, uh, first of all, that the Ten Commandments, uh, when we become Christians, the Ten Commandments return to us as gift. Shorn of their curse and condemnation, they return to us as gift to guide the Christian life. Um, Certainly the Reformers knew that. The Reformers preached the Ten Commandments. They couldn't think of uh, going for very long in the history of their churches without preaching the Ten Commandments. And uh, it was ethically very strong as a result. So, um, so just to say that the... And, and then he went on to say that each of the Ten Commandments is a little bit like an area code, telephone area code. Um, and. One of the ways I teach ethics at Regent is simply to take the Ten Commandments, give you the negative, and give you the positive. And that's pretty much, I challenge you to find anything in New Testament ethics that doesn't come under either the negative or the positive reflection of the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are, are all repeated in the New Testament. Bachmiel would say there is no new ethical material in the New Testament. Um, you might challenge that a little bit with the Sermon on the Mount, but, I, but even the Sermon on the Mount, what does Jesus say in the Sermon on the Mount? I haven't come to abrogate the law, I've come to fulfill it. And he actually, 
I hate to use the word radicalize. You can't use the word radicalize anymore, apparently, in the Christian church, because radicalize means something really bad. But um, w what I mean is that Jesus went back to the root of what the commandment meant. He's inventing something new. He's saying this is what the commandment always meant. So um, I, I guess I'm saying we can speak in the public square, A, because we believe in the power of the gospel, B, because the Torah is good news, even for those who don't necessarily accept it. And here's why. I've, I've missed this piece so far. Paul says that in Romans chapter 1, that every human being has a sense of the law in their hearts. The Gentiles have a sense of the law in their hearts. Um, and he even says that there is a civil use of the law in 1 Timothy chapter 2. He says the law, uh, is a, the law can be used in the civil court because it curbs sin. I'm, I'm, I'm basically uh, paraphrasing. So, uh, in other words, uh, it seems to me Paul allows for a sense of Torah in the hearts of non-Christians. Um, it's, you know, we could argue about whether it's enough to bring them to salvation, and probably most of us would say no. But do they have a sense of right and wrong? Yes, they do. Um, and, and you and I know non-Christian people who are more ethically upright than some of the Christians that we pastor, right? And that's, it's, it's, it's burdensome. But so all I'm trying to say is that the first thing about every human person is not their sin. The first thing about every human person is that they're made in the image of God. That they are image bearers who God loves. Yes, they are fallen, and that fallenness causes all kinds of distortions in them. But they're made in the image of God, and they still have a sense of Torah. And so we, I think we need to have uh, the, the, the freedom to speak into that. Now, how much you make of that is a theological sort of nice point or, you know, one of those nu nuances you can debate. So some people are really into natural law, capital N, capital L, and the Catholic persuasion is very strong on natural law, Thomas Aquinas, and uh, others would rather use the term in a small n, small l. Uh, my mentor, Alan Torrance, would prefer to use the word natural law in a small sense, um, not to make too much of it, um, and so on. So that's a little bit um, about speaking into the public square. Um, above all, when we do speak, let us speak with wisdom and let us speak with grace. All right, uh, let's, now, let's now read this. Uh, let me just uh, read this text again and we'll get back on to um, why it is that ethics is a challenging area for us as pastors and yet we do not want to lose heart. So my hope is that by the end of these two sessions you'll say, I haven't lost heart. There is hope. There's hope for me. There's hope for my church. There's hope for my society uh, under God. So, therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. Rather, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. Um, so, uh, it is easy to lose heart on this issue. What I'm going to do in this first session is give an outline of ethics. So for some of you, this will be a complete refresher because you probably did some ethics course sometime back there at seminary. Or, and for others, of it, it, may be, it may be new. I hope the way I do it will be new. And I hope that you will um, find help. Just sometimes it's having the right language that can help us to express ourselves in these areas. Um, it's easy to lose heart on this issue. First, because the big ethical narratives are unclear. The big ethical guideposts or guidelines are not always clear. If you were to sample two people in your congregation and ask them, why would, should they be obedient to God's law, the Ten Commandments? Why should they live an ethical life? Um, I, 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 it might be surprising to, to find out on what basis they, are, they argue. Um, there are four major approaches to Christian moral formation, and you may find yourself in one of these or in more than one of these. Uh, the first is consequentialist or teleological ethics. This is the idea that the ends justify the means. Um, so... Um, 
I don't, I'm not going to stay long on this one or on deontological ethics. Uh, it's just the idea that I must look at the consequences of an action, and the consequences of an action will help determine whether it's right or wrong. The opposite of that is deontological ethics, uh, which says no, consequences are not the issue. Something is either right or wrong in its very nature. And there are certain guidelines, there are certain um, commandments or sets of uh, applied uh, rules that will guide us uh, through this, this, uh, this kind of thinking. Now, consequentialist ethics in general, um, taken to an extreme, are, are awful. All right? They're the basis on which Hitler can decide he doesn't need the Jewish people because he thought you know, they, were, they were wrecking his society and so he needed to be rid of them, and the ends justify the means, so we have the Holocaust. So that's the worst possible way to think of consequentialist ethics. However, having said that, um, under the leading of the Spirit, and considering three and four, which we will in a moment, there are times when everything else is equal, right? Or you've got two principles in conflict, and consequences do become important, right? So. Uh, a person in the theological world, the evangelical theological world, who represents deontological ethics is Norm Geisler. Uh, Norm Geisler from Liberty uh, Seminary. I was a student of Norm Geisler's many years ago at Dallas Seminary. And uh, we used to call Norman Geisler Storm and Norman, because he was always storming about something. And uh, he was storming on off, often about deontological ethics. He believed the Ten Commandments are the commands we need, and everything in ethics can be taken care of by the Ten Commandments. Now, I've said there is a use for them, but he's saying they are it. That's it. Um, and there isn't much more. And he said, if you notice, there is kind of a, there's an order in the Ten Commandments. There is a beautiful order in the Ten Commandments, as I'm sure you've probably noticed. The first three have to do with God. Uh, first four have to do with God if you include the Sabbath. The Sabbath is kind of the window then into all of the action pieces. It's in Sabbath that we encounter God. And then out of Sabbath, by the way, I, I, I won't have a chance to speak to you about the ethics of Sabbath. I really hope you keep Sabbath as a pastor. It's crucial. Um, and it's not just a piece of legislation for the Old Testament. Uh, it's a creation mandate. Um, anyway, enough of that. Um, you know, it's funny. We have... We, we say we, uh, we wouldn't think of breaking uh, the commandment, you shall not steal, but we're quite good at breaking the Sabbath. We don't care about that. And uh, the Sabbath matters. And uh, let me encourage some reading in that area. Marva Dawn's book, uh, A Royal Waste of Time, is an excellent example of uh, something good on the Sabbath. So some of you are looking at me and you think I'm crazy, but honestly, it's, uh, my life has been transformed by keeping Sabbath. And our, our president, Rod Wilson, who's pride, pride, prided himself in being such a hard worker, and he is, um, uh, repented and, and, and now keeps Sabbath rigorously, and it really has transformed his life. Um, and Sabbath, by the way, isn't just a day off. I do hope you take a day off, but it's maybe what you do with your day off. Um, anyway, that was a little detour. Let's back on track here. Back on track. Um, and I think I can remember where we were. Yes, Norman Geisler, Deontological Ethics. So he says, it's all you need in ethics, and they are in order. So, for example, the ones at the bottom aren't as important as the ones at the top. So give me give an example, or they, they, they have a waiting. When Corrie ten Boom is standing at the door, and she, she, she's answered the door because the Gestapo have come to ask her if there are any Jewish people in her basement, what must she do? Um, see, the, the consequentialist ethicist has a good answer. I'm going to avoid murder, and therefore I'm going to lie. But Geisler says, you don't need consequentialist ethics for that. The commandments are, you know, thou shalt not kill comes before thou shalt not lie or bear false witness. Therefore, you are justified in lying in order to prevent uh, death. Right? So. Um, all the way down the line, he's, he's, got it, he's got it down to a fine art. Here's the problem with it. Here's the problem, and uh, I know he would have a good comeback for me, and who am I to say that Norman Geisler is wrong? We're all wrong on some things. Um, here's the problem. You start to deal with some of the niceties of bioethics that we've never encountered before in the history of the world. I'm not sure that you can go to the Ten Commandments just. That might be your big frame. But uh, what I was saying in chapel today is, 
um, there is no way to avoid a certain situational nature to ethics. I don't, I'm not using the word situational ethics in the Joseph Fletcher relativism sense. Remember Joseph, Joseph Fletcher was the person who said, all you need is love and I, whatever is the most loving thing to do. So for example, homosexual behavior is loving, so what's wrong with it? You know, how, could many, how could love ever be wrong? Um, so that's Joseph Fletcher's situation ethics. Uh, I'm saying situation ethics, small s, small e, that you are going to be put in situations often that have never been encountered before, that you have never encountered before, and there may well be conflicting principles. <clears throat> and uh, you, you've taken all of the Word of God as you, as you can discern it, all of the Word of God. Uh, you've consulted, you've uh, done all those things, but at the end of the day, you, you have to make a decision. And God entrusts us in that moment to make the decision. Um, and, and so I'm, I'm rushing on, uh, really already beginning to explain the fourth one, which is Christian Worldview Foundation. The third one is character or virtue ethics. <clears throat> this has become quite popular. Uh, it goes back to Aristotle. Alistair MacIntyre wrote the book After Virtue. Um, in which uh, it, it, Alistair McIntyre's book, After Virtue, is a significant book for Christian ethics today. Um, he wrote it, though, before he was a Christian. He wrote it as an Arist Aristotelian, and then he converted to Catholicism. He's a devout Catholic today. Um, and he's written a revised version of After Virtue. But in terms of, <clears throat> in terms of how he... Uh, exegetes culture and society today, he's bang on. And uh, he talks about modernity being the era where individuals were everything and where faith, <clears throat> where faith, and, uh, uh, where faith and reason get separated, um, where ethics become private. He talks about postmodernity, or, or at least Alice McIntyre and those who've ex exegeted him, like Jonathan Wilson, who's written Living Faithfully in a Fragmented World. Uh, he talks about the fact that um, there's postmodernity as well. Postmodernity following Nietzsche is kind of the destruction of the individual in many ways, and, and the will to power is everything, and everything's about the will to power. Um, postmodernity has been characterized by a deconstruction of reason, it has debunked modernity in some ways. Um, and extremes of postmodernity have actually deconstructed, deconstructed, deconstructed until there's nothing. Um, I think there's a middle of the road postmodernity which pokes holes in modernity and in some ways actually reinforces the way we do Christian theology. What do I mean? Um, we don't do Christian theology on the basis of pure reason. We admit that faith and revelation is our undergirding for our reason. Don't get me wrong, the Christian tradition is a very robust intellectual tradition. We have nothing to be ashamed of. You know, our, our culture today has no idea about the depths and the riches of the Christian intellectual tradition going back to Augustine, you know, Paul, Augustine, <clears throat> Anselm, um, Thomas Aquinas, uh, John Calvin, Karl Barth, all, all, massive tomes of powerfully reasoned theology, but most of those would admit that they do their theology on the basis of faith. That theology, as Anselm said, is faith seeking understanding. Now, that's not good enough for the modern, but it is good for the postmodern. For the, I don't mean the extreme post, postmodern, but for the postmodern who recognizes that all knowledge is prejudiced. Jamie Smith is a good, I'm going to throw out a bunch of books uh, today just for your encouragement. Jamie Smith's books are really helpful too, his one on radical orthodoxy. He talks about the fact that if our culture right now were true to what it really believes, Christians would be very welcome in the public square. Why? Because the, uh, modernity is on the way out, postmodernity is here, and postmoderns know that every narrative is prejudiced. Every narrative has some kind of a faith underpinning, including science. Yeah. So, uh, <clears throat> and therefore, he says, Christians, we admit 
that our reason is prejudiced, that is, that our reason is based on a prior presupposition. The prior presupposition is that God is and that he's spoken, and that he's spoken eloquently in Christ, and that he's spoken through his word, the Bible. That's our, that's our presupposition. So that ought to be quite consonant with some realms of postmodernity. So when our government says there's no place for the Christian in the marketplace to speak about ethics because our narrative is prejudiced, we ought to be able to stand up and say, and so is yours. All reason, all narratives are prejudiced. Um, I can get a little exercise when I talk about this. but um, So anyway, um, we are talking about virtue ethics and a, a, an assessment of culture done by Alistair McIntyre and people like Jonathan, uh, Jonathan Wilson. But here's the thing. Here's the reason why our culture isn't thinking clearly. Yeah, because we're now in post-modernity. We're not in modernity. We ought to be welcome at the place. At this. We ought to have a seat in the public square, but we don't. You know why? Because actually our culture does not have a... Um, it's fragmented. It's, it's a culture of fragmentation. There are bits of knowledge all over the place, and there isn't a carefully reasoned understanding of why people believe what they believe. Uh, we are fragmented in so many ways. Um, if you were to accost a person in the street and ask them, um, what's the source of your philosophy of life? Why, you know, why do you believe what you believe? And I'm going to guess he's going to, or she's going to say, the Dalai Lama, um, popular culture, the movies, and probably um, a little bit of church that I, I used to go to. And I, I like some things Jesus said. Um, and, and, and it's that fragmentation. That's why it's hard to have discourse. Because you're arguing, hopefully, on a very sound, you, 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 know, you know you can't prove what you're going to say because you, you rely on revelation. But you have a reasoned understanding of why you believe what you believe grounded in a narrative that you know about, and the narrative of the person in Western culture today is a, is a very fragmented, very fragmented narrative. And so right at the end of his book, Alistair McIntyre is he's trying to find hope for a culture that's fragmented. And, um, and he ends it with this little sentence. Um, I think I have it actually in my talk for the second talk, um, but I'll just mention the line. The line is, um, what we need is perhaps another Benedict. What does he mean? That we need a new form of monasticism. Uh, some people need to be called to be monks in order to be formed by the word and spiritual practices. Um, but really what he's saying, beyond those that might have that calling to be monks, is the calling of the people of God to live in community under the influence of the biblical narrative in order to be formed. So you know, you're, I believe one of the greatest challenges, uh, to put a point on what you do as a pastor, you're cooperating with God in his work to form people through the Christian narrative, through the preaching of the Word of God, through the sacrament, through all the spiritual practices that you engaged in, in order that they might be formed and then take their place in culture and society. And that is not an easy task. I was a pastor for 20 years. I served in three churches. Um, so I'm one with you. I'm not sitting here, you know, above you or something, because I know exactly what the challenges of the pastorate are and how difficult it is um, to, um, to get people to just to come to church once a week is a challenge. And we call that doing church. You're right, that's doing church, but it's not being the church. We need small groups, but we need more than just small groups. We need ways to get to people, people together so that they can actually feel that we are the church and that we're doing life together. And that's crucial in so many ways. It's crucial missionally, but it's crucial also for ethics. So, um, Alistair McIntyre um, and Stanley Harawas is the other name, often associated with the virtue ethics. We had... Uh, Jonathan Wilson speak to my class just yesterday, actually, in pastoral ethics. And Jonathan Wilson uh, knows Stanley Harris very well. And uh, he says that Stanley Harris is not a virtue ethicist. Um, 
So, so what's wrong with being a virtue ethicist? A virtue ethicist is someone who says, we need to cultivate virtue in people. What are the virtues? Well, you could go to Galatians 5, 22, 23, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, self-control. Or you go, go to that great passage in 2 Peter chapter 1, where Peter talks about participating in the life of God, and as a, as a result of that, add to your faith, virtue, and so on, down that list. All of those things are virtues. And you say, well, that's a worthy goal. Why aren't you a virtue ethicist? Um, there's a good reason. Because I think virtue is a piece of the story. I'm not comfortable calling myself a virtue ethicist. There's something bigger than my virtue and my character, and that's my personhood in the person of Christ, in, ensconced in the life of the triune God. That's where I want to begin. And then virtue comes. But, but virtue begins as human persons walking in participation with divine persons who, who then um, develop these, these, uh, these virtues. Um, so here are some of the weaknesses of virtue ethics. Number one, there's a downplaying of doing and an overemphasis on being. Uh, what do I mean by that? Do you remember when the when Yahweh instituted the imago, when, he, uh, when, when Yahweh created human persons in his image. Do you remember he said, male and female created he them? That will be important for our next discussion. But uh, he's no longer, he's no sooner given them the image than he commands them to do something. Rule the earth. Subdue it. Engage in uh, procreation. Raise families. Work. Uh, chapter three, of, chapter four of Genesis um, talks about somebody who was a metallurgist, the first scientist in the Bible, and then Jubal, Jubal, Jubal had a band. Jubal was musical. Um, I was once part of a uh, a youth group, and we had Jubal's band. So Jubal's band is the first first evidence of the arts. It seems, and, and the point is that doing is a part of the imago. God doesn't say. Okay, I've made you in my image. Now just gaze at me and get more and more iridescent with my glory. I mean, that's part of it. And, 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 and set up, uh, you know, a temple and do that for 24 hours a day. He doesn't say that. He says, I want you to go work. Why? Because creation isn't actually finished in Genesis 1. It's good, but it's not finished. And humankind are given the privilege to finish God's creation. How do they do that? by working, and by caring for creation. Creation care, folks, is not a sort of subsidiary part of the Christian mission. It's a crucial part of the Christian mission because it's our calling to be human. And what mission does is it help us, helps us discover our humanness again. Part of being human is to care for creation and teach our people to care for creation and to value the resources God has given them and to do his work in the world. And so can you see there's, an, there's a being dimension to Imago and there's a doing dimension to Imago, uh, the, the image of God. And I think sometimes virtue ethics to me sounds a bit like it's all about being. These people are so anxious to say, you know, make sure that you're engaging in the spiritual practices and make sure that you're being transformed from the inside out, all of which I agree with, but that will show up in behavior that's different. It will show up in our sexual behavior, it will show up in our, our social justice, all, all of those things that are, that are, that are important. Second uh, weakness of, um, that I find of virtue ethics is the narrowing of ethical resources by an overemphasis on narrative. Um, you know, narrative is the big word. And you probably use this a lot in your pe preaching, the story. Let's get into the story. And one of the wonderful things about the gospel, as Chris Wright says, is that there is room in the great big story of God's narrative for all the little stories. And that does preach. You know, every little story, the story of every little person in your congregation matters in the big story. And, and yes, the big story is really important, but is that all that is Christian theology, the story? Um, is that all we do is rehearse the stories. Um, the story, story, don't get me wrong, stories are powerful. Stories form us. You were so formed by those biblical stories you heard growing up, you have no idea. Uh, and I have no idea. But I sometimes worry there's a neglect of propositional truth. Um, things like Proverbs, things like commands. Not, the whole Bible is not in one genre. It's got many genres. We need to preach all of the genres, informing people. 
Um, and thirdly, sometimes I think there's an overemphasis on community in neglect, and to the neglect of transcendent reality. Um, so the, the virtue of ethicist wants you to live deeply into community. And there's something very good about that. Um, and, but experiments in community in the Christian church are, are fraught with failure. Because I think when we, when we focus on being communities and, and the focus is the community, we're going to run into difficulty. And people are going to break up out of those communities. When they're focused on Christ, so God has given us some things that shape the community. Preaching of the word, the sacrament, um, discipleship, all of those things that are, that are crucial. So I guess what I'm saying is um, let's, let's invite transcendent reality into our communities and they will be healthy. The community that does preach the word, the community that does observe the sacrament, the community that does um, uh, cultivate love, sacrificial love, uh, and that is open to the world that uh, God wants us to touch will be a healthy community. But if we make community itself uh, the focus, then we can run into difficulty. Let me just um, I illustrate. Uh, uh, Alan Hirsch who wrote a book on the missional church, and there's lots of good things about that book. One of the things he, he says in it that I like is, let's be, let's, let's, let's be about community tasks and not community. Community tasks means this precise thing, evidence of transcendent reality and also evidence of a missional impulse. And he says, so spiritual community or biblical community is not just being together, and he uses the word, it's not just huddle and cuddle. And as I think about the, the churches I've pastored, um, at least in the case of two of them, there was a resistance against me, I felt, as somebody with a missional impulse, because I threatened their little communities, which were very comfortable. Um, that was never articulated, and, you know, but, you know, lots, lots goes on in your heart as a pastor that you don't ever say or that you don't ever perhaps even know you're feeling. But as I think back, I think those little communities, where there were little communities who just loved being their little communities and doing the things that they did, if you, if you, if you, if you tried to push just a little bit and, and speak about the missional nature of God's communities or the, uh, or the piece about the transcendent reality of those communities, you would, you would struggle. Okay, so I've, I've told you what I, I, I've told you that these are three possibilities. Um, the fourth is the one I favor, and I'll, I'll just be um, blunt and honest about that. It's the Christian Worldview Foundation for Ethics. It's a theological Trinitarian participatory um, way of seeing ethics rooted in the nature and in the actions of God. It focuses first on the person of God. As I said this morning in my talk, we don't begin ethics with where we ought to go. We begin ethics with who. Not how, but who. Who is this triune God? And how have we come to know him? And how are we related to him? One of the crucial pieces, I think, in this is not only that the person of God is all important, but we get to be in God. This is union. This is participation theology. Uh, it's, it, it, apart from that, I think, I think we have no hope. Apart from my being in Christ, by the Spirit, orientated towards the Father, then ethics becomes impossible. It's because God has spoken and because God has reached out to us as humanity, and He is the ground and paradigm, He is the norm for ethics, and He's the power for Christian ethics. Let me, let me give some sub-points to those. He, God is the ground of Christian ethics. So what do I mean by that? Well, who is God? He's the God of holy love. The God who is majestic, moral, aesthetic, holiness. He defines the good. Ethics is about choosing the good. But what is the good? Wrong question. Who is the good? It is God and his character of holy love. The God of aesthetic holiness. We don't think about that very often, do you? You know, you know, we all know about the moral holiness of God. He is of pure eyes that behold evil. And the majestic holiness of God is his otherness. There's none like him. But he's also the God who's described as having the beauty of holiness. That's aesthetics. 
aesthetics are important to ethics. Um, in other words, God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in perfect harmony. Jonathan Edwards um, spoke about God as the supreme harmony of all. We tend to think of Jonathan Edwards as this austere, reformed figure who called down hellfire and all you may know is that he preached a sermon called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. That is a complete misunderstanding of Jonathan Edwards. I've just written a book on Jonathan Edwards. It's coming out in January. Um, so I just had to throw that in. Um, but, uh, I mean, I don't like everything about Edwards. I think, you know, Karl Barth has some things to say to him that would be helpful. But nevertheless, I, I just want to say to you that, that he, he, he had an understanding of the glory of God related to the fact that God is Trinity. And that God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit has this amazing, perfect, intermutual, interpenetrated nature. Three persons, one God. Three persons of irreducible identity. Three persons of complete interpenetration, perichoresis, or coincidence. And it is, it is as the, in their life together that they exhibit the glory of God. Um, Edwards even believed that music was an evidence of the Trinity. Um, so God is uh, the character of God and the covenant love of God. So under the ground and paradigm for Christian ethics, God is the good, and God is the covenant love of God. God is the God of covenant love, I should say. Um, and this presses us to keep ethics in light of the gospel, evangelical ethics, sanctification in light of justification. Third, second, God the norm for Christian ethics, uh, the triune being of God. Ethics as the discovery of personhood in community. Uh, Christ as the man for all humanity who defines what human persons are. Uh, this, this is a great thought. Jesus is the man for all humanity uh, in so many ways. Not only does he act for humanity in his life and death and resurrection and ascension, but he is um, the person in whom we see all the graces of God coming to fruition. Uh, so God, the norm for eth Christian ethics, is going gonna, is gonna to push me to start with image of God as crucial for, 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 for uh, ethics. What is ethics? It's about understanding that humans are made in the image of God. It's helping them to move into the recovery of the fullness of the image of God. Jesus Christ himself is the image of the invisible God. Uh, the church father Irenaeus said that Jesus, the last Adam, recapitulates the first Adam. And in Jesus you have the perfect man um, for us and in us, uh, whom we worship and in, in whose image we seek to be. So Christian ethics really is about helping people to become like Jesus, right? That's, that's simple um, in many ways. But it presses us also to say, as image bearers, we have vocation. We have human vocation, we have ecclesial vocation, and we have personal vocation. Um, I won't stay on that. The, the, the third point is that God is the power for Christian ethics. We've been stressing this today already, that God, God's grace motivates us and God's grace empowers us. God's presence is available to us, um, emphasizing the role of the Holy Spirit who makes Christ real to us. Uh, Carl Henry, um, really one of the foundation stones of Christian evangelical theology writes that the spirit is the dynamic principle of Christian ethics, the personal agency whereby God powerfully enters human life and delivers from a slave, enslavement to Satan, sin, death, and law. It was the Holy Spirit alone who had transformed the inescapable and distressing I ought. While the philosophical ethics was compelled to acknowledge and the tormenting thou shalt, which Hebrew religion adduced as its complement into the I will, of New Testament de eth ethical dedication and zeal. It's a beautiful statement. The role of the Holy Spirit in helping us not to be so much about I ought or thou shalt, but I will because of who you are in response to the gospel. Um, then, the, uh, just to whip through this quickly because I want to get on to the second point, um, the actions of God. Um, you can't really think ethically well until you consider the actions of God. Uh, the big story. What is the big story? Uh, creation, fall, redemption, and consummation. We at Regent right, like to stress that redemption is redemption of creation, not out of creation. That would be Platonism. 
or Gnosticism, not Christianity. So what God does is he redeems humanity and he redeems creation. And the new creation is uh, where God is headed. So creation, fall, redemption, and consummation of creation. Our destiny as the people of God is not to be angels. It's not to be disembodied souls wandering around in eternity. It's to be human persons who are embodied in the resurrection. And if you don't think that's important ethically, then listen to Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 telling us that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And you, in other words, he's saying your body is a future. And that, that future is in the... Re and then so his great chapter, the great chapter of the New Testament, 1 Corinthians 15 on resurrection, really is employed by Paul for ethical purposes. Our body matters in the future. So um, you say, what's this got to, to do with ethics and morality? Uh, think about things, first of all, from a creation perspective, God's good creation. So, for example, we think about sexuality. Sexuality, is it, is it good or is it bad? It's God's good creation, so it's good. The second point, the fall, is where we run into trouble with sexuality because good urges get distorted. But in terms of the body and sexuality itself, it's a good gift. Um, to illustrate, how, you know, sometimes I don't think we emphasize that enough, by the way, in our churches. We are, we are all about, you've got to avoid premarital sex, and you've got to avoid this, you've got to avoid that, and you know, all of those things, those ethical positions that we, that we, that we have, and I'm, I'm all for those, right? And then people get married, and uh, all the message they've heard for 25 years in the church is how bad sex is. Um, and then we wonder why some of them struggle with sexuality and marriage. Um, yeah, sexuality is a good gift of God. Um, other aspects of creation are the image of God, work, marriage and family, all of those things come under this heading. The fall, of course, is crucial. Um, this will become part of our discussion in the next session. The image of God has been defaced through sin, but not erased. Um, and, and so how much, you know, what does depravity mean? And inability, to best the word inability is better than depravity, but depravity is a good word in the sense that every aspect of our being has been affected by sin, but just how much has it done that, and, 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 and so on. Those are aspects for consideration. And then redemption. Uh, redemption is uh, crucial in ethics, as we've suggested. Um, one of the big pieces that I'm anxious to get across today is wrapped up in the word theosis. By theosis, I mean union of the people of God with Christ. Because I believe apart from that, we have no hope in the area of ethics. God has, first of all, loved us as sons and daughters. So much of our gospel preaching is forensics rather than filial. Let me explain. And this, this uh, doesn't help us with ethics. Let me explain. When you preach the gospel, you usually tell people, I shouldn't say you, I'm saying sometimes me or, or anybody else. I'm not preaching at you. Don't hear, hear, me, hear me clearly here. I'm just saying sometimes when we, the royal we, when we preach the gospel, we tell people they're sinners, that Jesus died on the cross for their sins, and that if only they will repent and believe, they can be forgiven and justified before God. I want to challenge you. I'm not sure that is the gospel. That's a part of the gospel. The first part of the gospel is that God loves humanity in Christ and that Christ has lived and died and risen again for humanity and that the aim of your coming to Christ is, yes, to have your sins forgiven and be blotted out, but it's so that you can be his, his sons, his daughters. That's filial. The forensic flows from the filial. I mentioned this morning John Calvin speaking about union with Christ. You know Unio Christi? And he talks about two duplex gracia, the two joint graces that come out from being un unified with Christ, justification and sanctification. Crucial. We're going to look at that in just a moment. But you see, the, 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 the trouble is we don't present gospel, the gospel as a coming into union with Christ often. We don't think of the gospel as adoption enough. We think of it as forgiveness. It's all forensic language. 
Forensic language, in my, in my opinion, is secondary to filial language in terms of the gospel. And why do I mention this? Because, because it's from that place of the filial, of being united with Christ, that we then have the, the assurance of justification and the power for sanctification. All right. Um, a summary of this um, way of thinking about ethics is this. The limitations of both deontological, teleological, and character of virtue ethics point to a transcendent vantage point from which to make ethical decisions, one discovered in relational participation with the triune God. So how do I do ethics? I do it in relationship with God. I come back to it. Three points. Christ, covenant, community. In Christ, in a covenant, a covenant which has a place for law, and it, which empowers me for law, and then in community, in ecclesial community, where I'm formed and where I also take advice. Um, closing this sort of big section, uh, the, the, the piece about the narratives, uh, these are the mottos. I, I, after teaching ethics for eight or nine years, I, I jotted down, what are my mottos? So, so what do I really believe about how you make ethical decisions? And these are the mottos. By the way, I forgot to say, I'll put all of these slides um, on a website or something so you can, you can access them. You don't have to take notes. I wish I'd said that at the beginning. What was I thinking? Your hands are tired. Um, yeah, no, feel free to take notes, but I will, I will put these, uh, um, either make them available as hard copies or you better put them online, we can save some paper. Um, so, ethics, um, uh, moral formation and ethics is about rest restoration to the image of God. Ought is determined by is. You've heard that a few times today already. Ethics is a listening to being as well as doing. Sounds like I contradict myself a little moment ago. I was stressing doing. I do believe in being as well. And, and maybe even I believe that be comes before do in priority. In other words, uh, it's be, do, be, do, be, do, and not do, be, do, be, do. You know what I mean? Be, do, be, do, be, do. Uh, in other words, contemplation and practices form us for the doing. Trinit Trinitarian participation is the space in which moral formation and ethical decision making occur. Likeness to Christ is being for the other. I'm not sure if we think about that very often. When we say, I want to be like Jesus, what do we mean? I have a, a shining image. I want to be, be iridescent like he is one day when I see the beatific vision. But if I think about what Jesus really is about, he's a person who's defined as the man for others. He's for his father and lives in perfect intimacy with him. And he's for the people around him. He's for the disciples. He's for the broken. He's for, you know, he, he comes across a widow of Nain who's lost her only son. The pathos of that passage is so powerful. There's a widow who's lost her husband. One loss. Second loss, she's lost her son. And Jesus comes across them and he ra raises the son from the dead. He's just so full of compassion. He exists for others. That's what being, I think, a truly holy person is. We're very much into ourselves. Being, ontology, cannot be divorced from hearing and doing. I kind of said that already. Torah is grace. Um, understood properly. Torah is grace, but there can be no Talmud. What do I mean by that? So the Talmud was the exposition of the commandments and rulings on things. And I'm sorry, but I can't hand you a little book at the end of this lecture and say, Anything that comes up in the ministry will be covered by this little book here. Uh, how I wished it would be the case. I had already left. The last church I served in was my first year at Regent. But obviously you still have friends in your church. And this couple, I'd worked with them through the issue of in vitro fertilization. And they had made the decision that as long as they fertilized all of the... Um, zygotes that they were it was okay they would fertilize them all one by one they would there would be none left uh, uh, frozen that was their particular decision and they had harvested all of them had had two children and they were now on in the car on their way down to the hospital in Vancouver in order for this last uh, ovum or fertilized ovum to be implanted 
And the people from the clinic phoned them and said, you know, we wouldn't normally even phone people. We would just tell them not to come, but um, your ovum is compromised. It's, it's, got, it's got damage. And we don't encourage you to implant it. So, they're around about the, uh, the tunnel on Highway 99, and they call guess who to ask what they should do. And so, it's, you know, you, you've received those phone calls. Pastor, t please help us. What, what should we do? Um, so I'm going to try to illustrate what I did as a hopefully a way of Trinitarian participational communitarian ethics. First of all, I cried out to God in my heart. I said, help. Lord, help me. Um, and then, and so I tried to listen well. I listened to them talk. It was complicated, actually, for, by a number of things. She wanted to take on the zygote, and he didn't want her to do it. Why? Well, because she actually was at risk medically for another pregnancy. That actually should pretty much solve the ethical issue right there in most cases. But, um, but he, he, wanted to have, he wanted to have that, uh, that child. And so I'm trying to do this in tune with the Holy Spirit, asking him to minister to me. I'm listening to them, trying to, I'm asking them, what do you think? And what do each of you think? That's a good, thing, good question to ask. It gives you more time, for one thing. Um, and, but it's actually very important because the dynamics start to come out. And you can maybe discern a bit of tension and conflict and, and all that sort of thing. And suddenly I remembered that we had on our staff at Regent a, a um, medical person. A, um, she was actually a pediatrician. And uh, she wasn't a gynecologist, but she dealt with a lot of these things all the time. So, how do you do ethics? In participation with God, informed by the Word of God, in a state where you're trying to live faithfully for God with spiritual practices, in community with the people of God. Right? And it's that, that piece that suddenly came into my head as I'm on the phone with them. I know somebody who might help us with this. She may know details about this that I don't know. And I, I consulted. You remember this. You took my ethics course, right? Hopefully you remember this piece. I'm not going to ask you in anticipation, I put you on the spot or anything. But I say to the most important words in, in pastoral ethics are consult, consult, consult. Yeah. Well, they're second to commune, 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 and contemplation with God. Consult, consult, consult with community. We're not isolated, and you're not isolated. It, it, I honestly think most of the decisions that you have to make ethically are, don't need to be made in a hurry. But we often feel the pressure, and, and the, the people of God put the pressure on us, and they say, you know, Pastor, you'll know the answer to this. The truth is you may not know the answer to this until you've consulted, until you've read. And what's the hurry anyway? You know, the kind of person who phones you on... On, uh, on Sunday afternoon and tells you that their marriage is falling apart and they need to see you right now. And the truth is their marriage has been in trouble for the last you know, six months and they can easily wait till Tuesday, but you know, they need to see you right now. Um, it's, that's the kind of thing that happens. And, and so communion with God, Trinitarian participation, includes communion with the people of God and drawing on the areas of expertise. So I phoned her up and what I, what I found out was that these zygotes that are damaged almost never take anyway. 99% of them don't take. They don't stay in the womb. And when they heard that, that resolved the issue. So they didn't take it on. Um, and so I was so glad I phoned her up. Um, but my point was, uh, I, there is no textbook. I can't give you the textbook because you're going you're to encounter a situation that's slightly different. How will you know? You need to be informed by the word in community with God's people, in communion with God, and consult, 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 and God will help you make a way. All right, secondly, it's, um, secondly, it's easy to lose heart. I don't know what's happening to my machine here. So it's easy because the big ethical narratives are, are unclear. So I'm not sure if this is old hat for you, these four ways of thinking about ethics. Um, if it is, forgive me. If it's not, 
um, then perhaps you can think about these four ways and, and read some more. I gave, a, I gave a, a reference, I think in your notes somewhere, of the book by, um, it's called Choosing the Good, um, and it's, uh, uh, the name of the author has just escaped me right now, but I will, I'll come back to it. He outlines brilliantly those four options. And, and, and he also makes the point that even if you are number four or number three, it's not that you don't ever use number one and two. So sometimes you do, you do have a deontological base for what you think about ethics. And there are times when you will have to think about consequences. Where was, where was teleological ethics? Where was conse consequential ethics in my discussion a moment ago with that couple? Where did I talk about consequences? The health of the mum. That, that's one consequential argument, uh, which is a valid argument in the midst of this discussion about Trinitarian participation. Um, if, if it, uh, you know, one of the most difficult decisions in ethics is when there is a, a mom who's in deep distress with a pregnancy, and do you save the mother or do you save the baby? And the ethics, I believe, are that you save the mother if you can, because she can produce more children. Okay, what kind of an argument is that? That's a consequentialist argument. It's a very tough argument. But you're almost forced to it because you have a choice that's based on principles. Um, so yeah, it's not easy. It's not easy. They're, they're... Okay, the second thing is, because there are disparate views of how justification and sanctification relate to each other in the tradition. Um, when am I supposed to stop, Doug? Okay, I'll, I'm going to flash through the rest of this talk and then take questions. Yeah. So, because there are disparate views of how justification and sanctification relate to each other in the tradition, um, so why do we struggle with ethics? Because we're not sure about how justification and sanctification relate. And I'll just, I'll just flash through these really quickly. So here's Luther. Um, well, I've actually started with the Roman Catholic persuasion that justification and Sanctification are both wrapped up in union with Christ, but they're conflated. They are kind of one and the same thing. Orthodox are similar. Justification is dependent on deification. And deification itself is sanctification. Union with Christ is very important. And, and for Protestants, if any of you are Lutheran, um, well, Luther, Luther was a wonderful theologian because he rediscovered justification that it had gone missing in the tradition. And we all, as evangelicals, are the beneficiaries of his great doctrine of justification by faith. But, as often happens, Luther made so much of justification that he neglected sanctification, at least on one, in one way of interpreting it. Uh, that's why when Calvin comes along, he talks about justification and sanctification. And interesting, Calvin deals with sanctification in his institutes before he deals with justification, because he's correcting subtly. Luther's emphasis on justification. Justification, and Luther is, I am righteous before God. This isn't this amazing. Let's go and sin boldly. Now, I, I, he doesn't, that would be a complete misunderstanding of, of Luther, but it says something about him. And Calvin says, hey, no, no, no. Union with Christ is the basis for Christian theology, and related to it are justification imputed, sanctification emphasized. Let's go through these quickly. Edwards, is, uh, Edwards actually emphasizes sanctification too much, in my opinion. Um, and, and it becomes the basis for justification. That's why, controversially, somebody wrote a book called Jonathan Edwards' Catholic Theologian. And if you're Reformed, you probably want to, want to hear that, but there was some truth to it. Uh, N.T. Wright, N.T. Wright, Justification and Sanctification, but N.T. Wright's the sort of new, the new, um, the new, uh, the new Pauline theology under N.T. Wright stresses the covenant nature of God in justifying uh, humanity through Christ, who is the new Israel. But the sentence tends to sound like it's sometime in the future we may know we're justified. I, I could be reading wrong a little bit, but um, sanctification, I think, slightly over overemphasized. Karl Barth adds vocation, which is very mission, the mission of the church. If you belong to Christ, you're not only justified and sanctified, but you're on mission because Christ is missional, you are missional. Um, and then Wesley came in. And it seems to me that he stresses the importance of sanctification, but seems to believe that there's a need for a second experience after conversion that will bring you into that union. And he even articulates some kind of a perfectionist theology, perfectionism. Um, I'm a, 
the ordained minister with the Christian Missionary Alliance. We've been, we've been influenced a little, by, a little bit by Wesley um, and by the Keswick movement. Uh, I put, this is Keswick and also the, the uh, sorry, Wesley and the Keswick movement. But we struggle with the relationship between these things. We're not quite sure how to preach them. And I really, I really want to recommend Calvin. I think Calvin has this nailed. Um, and he's a, a very powerful emphasis on the Holy Spirit. But, of course, you have come from traditions also where the Holy Spirit is emphasized, so this is all good. Um, because of the different versions, therefore, of sanctification. So the, point number three is the relationship between justification and sanctification. This one is sanctification itself. What is sanctification? What is our doctrine of sanctification? Remember one of the profs I, um, that spoke at chapel when I was a student at Dallas Seminary stood up and he says, I'm going to talk about sanctification and I know that none of our faculty are agreed with anything I say. And all of our faculty are, are all over the place with regard to what sanctification is. So, so mildly troubling. But um, it, it's, it's true. Uh, we struggle with it. I think there are three versions, by and large, of holiness in the Christian tradition. Augustinian Reformed activism, Wesleyan perfectionism, and Keswick passivism. Not passivism, pacifism, but passivism. So let me start with a third, the idea that once you've had this second experience, you just need to be passive. Let go and let God, and you're okay. Well, Augustine and the Reformers would have an issue with that. They would say, you still have a sinful nature, and sanctification is a fight till the day you die. It's a fight of mortifying the deeds of the flesh and vivifying the graces of the Spirit in the power of the Spirit, but it, you're involved. You take action. You are responsible. And there are practices involved in that. And Western perfectionism is kind of in the middle. Um, and lastly, because of its hardness, what do I mean? It's just hard growing, isn't it? Oh, man. Um, you know, I have, I have enough difficulty with my own person, let alone tell how many number of people are in my church how to live. Uh, you know, when you start out in the Christian life, you, you, you seem to overcome things kind of fast, and then you get into some ruts. Puritans used to talk about pet sins that we have that are rooted that require deep soul work, you know, anger that we have, uh, all, all of those things. Um, I went into a deep depression in my early 30s and realized in the midst of that depression that I was harboring a lot of anger in my life, that, and with it pain. And I couldn't actually stand at the door and greet people after I preached. I just wanted to preach, because preaching is easy. I stand six feet above contradiction. And I don't have to get close to anyone. And uh, so God in his sovereignty allowed me to go through a very significant clinical depression. I still struggle with depression to this day. And part of the journey, I, I was stuck relationally. I was not available to my wife very much emotionally. I was not available to my kids. And I used work as my way of staying away from that. Plus fairly academic, got a lot of stuff in my head. You know, you've got your stuff in your head, it's easy not to listen to what's going on in your heart. In fact, we are masters of denying what's in our hearts by means of our head games, the head games we play. Um, but at any rate, uh, I went through two years of profoundly deep therapy for anger from a Christian, uh, um, um, Anglo-Catholic um, psychiatrist. And that was my journey of sanctification in those two years, getting a grip on anger, getting a grip on some of the pain that kept me from being in relationship. And after all, isn't that the primal sin that we don't love well, that we don't love perfectly? And so God had to do that in me. So what I'm saying is this is hard stuff. But Paul did not lose heart. And so I don't want you to lose heart. And uh, I hope that this way of thinking will challenge you. Um, what I, what I'm, what I've, op I've offered you options, but I'm really pressing into the core. The core is cultivate your intimacy with the triune God. Live into Christ. He will, as you live into Christ, you will realize the assurance of justification, and that will further fuel your pursuit in happy, unguilty pursuit. 
And in union with Christ, he will step by step transform you from the inside out, helping you to put to death those things that are old and that are part of your old life and um, enabling you to live into new life. And, and as part of that, can I encourage you in the area of practices? Practices. What do I mean by practices? Um, I think it was Dallas Willard who said, who organized the spiritual practices or spiritual disciplines under two headings, mortification and vivification. See, we tell our people all the time, put to death the old ways, you know, and live in the resurrection life with Christ. And they're asking, how? And as Protestants, actually, we're not very good at telling them how. We don't know practices very well. As Jim Houston has said, we've had to look over the fence into the Catholic tradition to find out some practices. And now we've made them our own, and I'm not suggesting that we all defer and we all go to the Catholic, into the Catholic faith to be good, good Christians, but I am saying we can learn from them and that there are practices that we need to be encouraging our people of God in, helping them journey together through. So practices like confession and um, confession and uh, solitude and silence and confession and, and things like uh, worship, uh, communal, communal, communal practices, listening to the word, taking the sacrament. Taking the sacrament, by the way, is so crucial, so crucial. I don't know why in the world we do it once a month. It defines the church. And it's what the New Testament church did when they came together. And as you gaze on the person of Christ and feed on Christ time after time after time, you will be transformed. Okay. I'm done the big picture, and it took me longer than I expected. Please forgive me. I will, I will honor your half hour in the next session, I can assure you, because there's so much to talk about when we talk about homosexuality. But, yeah, um, maybe in these ten minutes, let, first of all, the five minutes, get together with the people at your table. And um, so here are some questions. Answer the question, what is your tradition with respect to transformation theology? What are your best practices for moving in that direction for yourself and the church? And how might you learn from the traditions of others? Maybe choose which one you'd like to deal with because you're not going to have time to deal with them all. What is your own tradition? Well, that will take five seconds. Uh, what are your best practices for moving in that direction? Talk about spiritual practices in the life of your church that help people.